For much of our history, the shoreline was the limit of our world. The early people, making their first unstable journeys upon the waves, returned with stories of dangers that in time became myth. We look up at the night sky and wonder, what's up there? But with the oceans covering so much of our world, what do we really know is down there? I'm D.L. Strand. Welcome to Storyteller's Pub, where we've always got something dark on tap. Now sit back and relax while I present to you Catch and Release. The boat cruised out of the harbor under a cataclysm of stars. Unbroken by waves, the water reflected the cosmic show. This was Ken Russell's favorite time of morning. Although, to most people, it wasn't morning at all. 3 a.m. was still nighttime. His friends would just be getting back home from the neighborhood bar, resting their spinning heads on stuffed foam pillows. Not Ken. Ken was a night owl, but in reverse. He loved the waning hours, when the night gave her best performance. Shooting stars chased across the sky, regardless of what people did down here. You couldn't fish out or clear-cut the constellations. Immune to smog and global warming, the universe kept spinning, and every day he came out to see it, to be a part of it, just he and his boat motoring out into the middle of creation. Today was Monday, or it would be once the sky lightened and the stars faded away. Other boats stayed moored to their cleats, taking a day off after a busy weekend of ferrying tourists out to hunt for whales. It was impossible to turn down the money fetched out of apparently bottomless pockets. Mondays, however, were just for him. No first mates, no strangers cracking wise about one thing or another, talking constantly, never listening to the wind or the waves. It wasn't for them. This was his reward for dealing with inane questions and seasick stomachs. Cassie, his wife, didn't need to understand why he had to go out on his days off. It was part of the deal. Love me, love my boat. Even she wasn't welcome on his solo sojourns. He treasured the chance to commune with the sea, nature, God, the cosmos itself. To Ken, it was like breathing and just as necessary. The teak and diesel fumes mixed with the salty air. He breathed it in and became one with his vessel. Her name, the Night's Mistress. He didn't follow a map or compass, but let the stars guide him. The Milky Way, a glowing river in the sky, mirrored in the surrounding water. He pointed the bow down the middle of its celestial current and left the land and people and their bullshit behind. His motor droning steadily beneath him. Its steady, genial hum relaxed him, a constant ohm on his meditative journey. Once past the buoys, he pushed the throttle down. The bow raised for a moment, then relaxed and eased back into place as it adjusted to its new speed, humming along, wedging through liquid glass. He headed for the trench, an underwater canyon more grand than anything on land. The lips spit out rich nutrients that drew life from up and down the coast. It was hard not to be philosophical when the earth held so much beauty and surrendered it for free. Ken didn't think himself blessed. He knew it. He opened her up wide and let her run, let her stretch and breathe. It was good to push the engine once in a while, clear out the dust, He'd never drive so fast with a boatload of tourists. One unexpected swell and someone was likely to fall face first into a gunwale and split open a chin. The skin would part and blood would flow like money out of his wallet. No, he saved the fun for his alone time, when no one cared how fast he went or how choppy the water. The cabin offered shelter from the chilly wind, but he stood atop that, behind the wheel, in the place he called the perch. He witnessed the world in 360 degrees. Nothing came between him and the sting of the morning air. He cleared the mouth of the bay, giving a wide berth to Lighthouse Rock, that place with its stubby tower, long abandoned and falling to the elements, made him uneasy. It always had. 
Once, when he was young, just a high school freshman, a friend invited him over to see his pet snake. Behind the glass, the western diamondback stared at him through lidless eyes. Did it sleep, or did it lay quiet, trying to draw in a young hand into which it could push its venom? The lighthouse made him feel the same. It exuded a quiet malevolence, abandoned since the final crew had somehow disappeared over fifty years before. It now stood silent and still, waiting. He pushed the throttle a little farther. The motor paused like a drummer missing a beat, then powered on, steady and true, putting the decaying structure behind him. With a sea so calm, he made good time, and soon arrived at the trench, and after slowing down, silenced the motor. The wake he'd kicked up rolled beneath him on its journey toward the horizon. His boat now floated over a gorge far deeper and wider than the Grand Canyon, unexplored, unreachable. He took a deep breath, inhaling the silent infinity in which he floated. The universe opened just for him, and all things were possible. He brought out his rod, well worn from years of use, and attached his lure with practiced hands, calloused by decades at sea. In all the grand cosmos, might there be a fish for me? He wondered. He cast the line aft. The reel buzzed as the shiny stand-in for an injured fish flashed in the starlight, then fell into the mirrored galaxies with a subtle plop. He let it sink until he judged it deep enough, then turned the reel one turn. The bail flipped closed with a click, no longer allowing the line to play out. Then he turned the crank, bringing the lure back home, along with any predator hungry enough to fall for its ruse. Every angler had his own style, the speed of his wrist, the rhythm of his pull, his own imitation of what a hungry denizen of the deep might find irresistible. Like an actor getting into character, he dons the scales and fins and gills and limps through the water desperately trying to get to the safety of the boat, while another part of him hopes for a strike. The lure came back unmolested, dripping water as he hoisted it over the rails, and then in a swift, smooth motion, his rod, an extension of his arm, threw it back out again. Again he waited, then clicked the catch and reeled it in. Reel, rod, man, boat, sea. They all became one. His senses cast out along the line, trying to feel the life down below the waves. There was something down there, and it was hungry. He knew it. Had he chosen the wrong appetizer? He decided to change lures. He set the rod against the rail and grabbed the line, letting his hand slide down. Something distracted him. Maybe it was the way the full moon glinted off the sparkling plastic body. Whatever it was... It pulled his eyes away for just an instant. The instant his hand grasped the fake fish and the son of a bitch bit him, both hooks sank into the meat of his first and middle fingers. Ken hissed. This had happened many times before. Hooks are gonna hook. Still, it hurt. He squinted. Thankfully, neither had sunk past the barb. He gingerly backed the twin fangs out of his skin, then squeezed the injured fingers, encouraging his blood to flush the wounds clean. A few drops dripped into the ocean. He shook out the pain, then hunted through his tackle for a replacement. A bit of yellow caught his eye. He pulled it out. It was the cardboard backing of a lure he'd never opened. Brand new. Under the stiff plastic cover, a cylindrical shape waited to be freed. For a moment, he couldn't remember where he'd gotten it. Ah, that's right, he recalled. Our anniversary. Cassie'd given it to him, wrapped in red tissue. He'd accepted it with the feigned enthusiasm of someone who knew crap when he saw it, but didn't want to hurt her feelings. In this low light, it didn't look so bad, though. Deep blue on top, silver on the sides that faded to a white belly, with flashes of yellow and pink around the gills. It was large, as long as both of his hands held finger to finger, and as he appraised it in the moonlight, it didn't look like prey. It looked like it meant to hunt. Two hooks shined bright silver, lethal in the moonlight. He turned it over and spotted the price still stuck to the cardboard. 
A hundred dollars? For a lure? He scoffed and almost dropped it back into his box. But something stopped him. What the hell, he thought. The money spent. He grabbed the Leatherman tool from his belt and sliced the packaging. His injured fingers smeared blood on the body. Once attached to the swivel that joined it to the line, he held it up. The mouth had been painted open and snarling like a World War II fighter plane. Underneath, he spotted a small bump. It marred the otherwise streamlined body. He moved his thumb over it, and it gave a little. He pressed. The thing lit up. A row of lights ran down the sides in sequence. The body squirmed. He scoffed again, let go the line, and readied his cast. He set the bale and threw. It flew through the night, streaking like a shooting star, seeming to hang in the air for just a moment, then dove into the water without a sound. As he reeled it in, it felt heavier, as if it was fighting him. He felt it out, trying to find its rhythm. As the lure approached the boat, he saw a silver flash in the water. It shot toward the bow, then on its own changed direction and darted toward the motor. He paused and it dropped into the dark. He started again and it flew up and skipped across the surface like a herring or sardine. This was incredible, he thought. It may not catch any fish, but it was definitely amusing. Intrigued, he cast out again and again. Every time it entered the water without a sound and then seemed to shoot one way, then the other, at random. This was going to take some getting used to. Ken spied a larger flash just below. It could have been the moon's reflection. He sent it back to where it had just come from. This time he let it sink deeper and wound it more slowly, thinking to himself, I'm just a little guy, minding my business, thinking fishy thoughts. The rod jerked hard, arching over and straight down. The reel whined as the line streaked through the metal eyes and into the depths. His arms reacted immediately, instinctively, pulling hard to set the hook. His heart sang. He let it run, fighting to keep the rod pointed toward the stars above, as the end looped over and aimed toward his adversaries down below, now bolting one way and then the other. Finally, it paused. It was Ken's turn. He pulled up hard against the weight, then reeled in a few yards. Then he hauled it up again and reeled in some more. His arms strained at the weight and power of the thing. Impossible to know what it was, only that it was big. The rod jerked again, and every bit of the hard-won string he'd recovered, and more, so much more, ran back out into the sea. It was tempting to tighten the drag, to make it harder for the line to play out, he knew better. Given any more resistance, it would snap. No, this fight would be won by guile and endurance. Patience. His experience against instinct. His arms against a creature constantly in motion. Its body, however large, was one muscle, building its strength every day. Ken knew people who hunted on land, matching bullets to feathers. Where was the challenge? Was it sport going up against a creature, guns blazing, dogs barking? No, this was the way it was meant to be, faceless, anonymous until the last moment. Neither opponent knew anything of the other. The pole snapped upward, the tension released. Had it spit out the hook? Had the line broken? Maybe. Maybe not. The taut line had connected him to his quarry. Now, with the line loose, he was blind. He reeled in as quickly as his hand could go. It was there. It had to be there. The reel ratcheted as the line wound around it. Ken kept his eye on the water, the unnaturally calm water. The sound hit him first. A moan, low and loud and close. The boat bounced as if it had hit a rock at full speed. His world bucked and Ken flew. His hands dropped the rod as they shot out to brace his landing. He could only watch as the deck passed underneath him. His flight ended quickly as he splashed down into the icy water. His clothes clung to his limbs, encumbering his efforts as their weight pulled him down. He kicked his heavy shoes and pulled with arms fatigued by his battle. The surface hovered just out of reach. 
Time slowed, the way it does when adrenaline floods your system and you're fighting for your life with hope hovering just inches away from your fingers. The night's mistress floated just a few yards away, still upright, bobbing like a cork that had been dropped into the water. Beyond that, the stars that had once shined so brightly had gone dark. Despite his efforts, he was stuck in place. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't swim any higher. His boots, of course, they weighed him down. He tried with one foot to kick off the other. It was useless. With his lungs aching for air, he paused and reached down to untie one. His numb fingers fumbled for the laces. He looked down, but he lost his legs in the murky depths. He couldn't see his feet. He gave up and began again his fight for the surface, but as he gazed upward, it was now much further away than before. His boat, hardly visible, floated carelessly away. Hope drifted with his vessel. Cassie's face appeared before him, bright in the gloom, smiling as she did when he came home in the afternoon, her sandy hair loose about her face, her tummy large with their unborn son. His son. He'd never see him, never feel those tiny fingers wrapped around his own, never teach him to fish. He fought. God, how he fought but the water passed through his outstretched fingers like thick smoke and his life drifted further away. Where had the stars gone? He felt the pulse pounding in his head, the quick thump of his heart echoing through his body. It slowed. He still struggled, but even he knew it was useless as the boat became smaller, now hard to see through the dim murk. A calm swept over him. He'd lost. The fear, the desperation, drifted away along with everything else in a slow, weak heartbeat. He relaxed. The hard part was over. Rest was a breath away. He just needed to inhale the cold salt water that he'd loved all his life. Simply let nature run its course. His head bobbed as his arms floated drawn up by the momentum of his body as it dropped lower and lower. He no longer knew if his eyes were open or closed, so complete was the darkness. The cold disappeared, replaced by languid warmth. Death was warm. Who knew, he thought, as he was enfolded in its embrace. He felt he was wrapped in a snug, moist blanket as cold air prickled his face. Air. He coughed. Water vomited out of his lungs. They expanded painfully, then forced more liquid out. He inhaled and heaved again. This time, they filled fully, but they were sore and starved for air. He gasped again and again. Finally, Russell opened his eyes and stared into a massive yellow moon hovering in a starless sky. He wiped the water from his face. When he looked again, he saw that it wasn't a moon upon which he looked. Rather, it was a gigantic eye, one of a pair that gazed back, and as he glanced around himself, he found he was clasped in a massive, taloned hand, suspended high above the water. A low moan drew his gaze to the area just below the eyes, where a tangle of serpentine tentacles writhed in the space its nose and mouth should have been. Was this a dream? The afterlife? The monstrous face leaned closer. He was to be eaten, he thought, and tried to scramble back, but the hand held him firm. As life returned to him, so did his will to fight, and he considered jabbing the great orb with his fist. Then he noticed that beneath the eye, something sparkled. A tear? No, it was solid, dangling, shimmering with running lights, gyrating in place. It was his lure tearing the tender flesh as it danced. Blood streamed from the wound. He was brought closer still. Not completely convinced he wasn't dead, he freed an arm and reached toward it. He was still too far away. It raised him further, and with his trembling hand, he touched the lure. The beast flinched and cried out. The grip tightened, expelling the air from his lungs. He squirmed, and the grip relaxed. 
As it slowly brought him closer again, he freed his other hand. Easy, boy. I'm just going to... His voice trailed off as he got close enough to see. Both hooks had embedded themselves in the monster's face. He grasped the lure, found the button, and pushed. The lights went dark and the creature sighed. Pliers would make this so much simpler. The thought had just formed when he remembered the Leatherman he kept in his belt. He wormed his hand down and freed it. First, he needed to cut the line, still attached to the plastic snout. He looped it around the blade and sliced. The string parted and he felt, rather than saw, the rod he'd owned for decades descend into the sea. The trick was freeing one hook without forcing the other one deeper. He unfolded the tool, revealing long, needle-nose pliers. This is gonna hurt you a lot more than... They grasped the tiny barbed weapon. He flicked his wrist. Tentacles splayed out, revealing an alien cavern of a mouth ringed with rows of shark teeth. The beast screamed and jerked. Breath was again squeezed from Ken's body. The tool dropped from his hand and followed his fishing rod as the beast flailed his arms through the air several stories high. Did he feel a rib crack? He smacked the hand, trying to get the beast's attention. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he screamed. Slowly, the beast calmed, and the grip again relaxed. Its free hand felt the wound and found the lure still embedded. Ken inhaled carefully, almost filling his lungs before he felt the sharp pain he expected. He blew it out. Okay, okay, let's have another look. Even more tentatively this time, he was returned to the face. He had freed one hook, but one remained. Let's try this a different way. He caressed the rubbery skin, and oh so carefully, pinched it around the intruding barb, widening the hole. With his other hand, he slowly, ever so slowly pulled. The beast wailed and squeezed its eyes shut, but kept its hands still. You're doing great, Ken encouraged through clenched teeth, and finally eased the hook out. He patted the great cheek and held the trophy up for the beast to see. The tentacles relaxed. The beast nodded, and with a humph, it returned him gently to the planks of his beloved boat. Then, without a sign or sound, the massive beast disappeared beneath the waves, leaving no trace it was ever there. Ken stood, for how long he couldn't say, in his soggy clothes, shivering in the night, looking out over a tableau where he couldn't say where the sky stopped and the ocean began. He knelt on wobbly legs and returned his spilled tackle to the box, giving the miraculous lure a sideways glance and dropped it in as well. Then he returned his rod to its holder in the gunwale, started the engine and pointed the bow east toward the rising sun and home, where he was going to have a conversation with Cassie about the consequences of overpaying for fishing gear. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please subscribe and share it with someone you know who loves horror, paranormal thrillers, and things that scratch on your door in the dead of night. You can email me anytime through my website, storytellerspub.com. Catch and Release was written and performed by D.L. Strand. The Storytellers Pub podcast is a production of Storytellers Publishing. I'm D.L. Strand. Thank you for joining us here at the pub. Please come again.